All right, we're going to go live now. We're live. So what I'll do is we're going to go through as people join. We will uh, stop if people have any questions. Some people like to watch on Facebook. So that's why we go on Facebook. And um, if you have any questions or any points you want to add, please free, feel free to, to, to add them as we're going along. So tonight's topic is the topic of charity. What I'm going to start off with charity is discussing what is charity from a Jewish perspective. The word charity in Judaism is the word tzedakah. Now, if you were to look at the word tzedakah, tzedakah spells, comes from the, the root of the word tzedakah is tzedek, which means righteousness, right? So when, when people look at charity from a secular perspective or from a general perspective, we say, well, one individual has been particularly uh, successful for whatever, worked very hard, uh, very smart, and came up with great money-making ideas. And as a result, he's got all this money. So therefore, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go and ask that person to share some of their money with us. And that's going to be charity. Judaism, Torah looks at it very different. It doesn't say that it's giving, it says it's righteousness, which means as follows. The Torah tells us that God is the one that provides us with our money, with everything that we have. And therefore, when Hashem decided to give you some money, he may have decided to give it to you but sometimes he only gave it to you to hold on to, to be his ambassador to give it to somebody else. So that's the concept of money. Money really is something that belongs to Hashem. We acknowledge that Hashem is the one, the giver of money, of sustenance. And we have to do what we can to be successful financially and in other areas of our lives. And then to take what our success and give it to Hashem, give it back to God, acknowledging that it's not ours only, but it was given to us by Hashem to share with others as well. Yes, it's there to take care of our needs, but it's also to give away. So that's the main uh, change is right in the name of tzedakah. The word tzedakah is righteousness. So why is it righteousness or justice? Justice is mean that when you give away, you're actually doing justice. You're not doing something kind. Oh, I'm so kind. I'm giving away. So the Talmud says more than the kindness that is done by the individual that gives is the kindness that is done by the recipient. Could you imagine a world of people that refuse to accept charity? Could you imagine a world where nobody wants to take charity from another person? You can't imagine, right? Everyone seems to be more than happy to take charity. Always everyone seems to need money. But there are some people that refuse. Um, and when people do need and they accept, they're doing a greater mitzvah. They're giving a greater opportunity than the actual person that is uh, making that happen. Good evening, Sam. Um, so that's that's the really important idea when it comes to charity. Remembering that when we give, we are actually being given a huge benefit by the recipient. That recipient has allowed us to fulfill ultimately the mission and the purpose of our money. So that's why the word justice is there. Tzedek, tzedakah. Tzedek means it's justice. They're doing, we're doing justice with our money. God gives us money, and we have an opportunity now to share that money with somebody else or with another cause. If we keep all the money for ourselves, then we're doing an injustice with Hashem's money. When we do tzedakah, we're doing justice with God's money. You understand the difference? Okay. 
So therefore the Torah actually tells us, the, 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 the rabbis tell us, good evening, Sam. Could you hear me? Can't hear? I can't hear you either. You're muted. Well, yes, I'm unmuted, but I can see you. You can't see me? Mm -hmm. You can or you yeah. can't? I can't. Huh. For some reason, anyway. Doesn't yes, matter, but I can see you. No, no. Okay. I don't know why you can't see me. Maybe there's something with your screen. Possible, possible. Could, uh, could everybody else see me? Leon and Irene, good evening. Could you see yep. me? Yep, clearly. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, I don't know what happened, Sam. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Okay, so we've started by introducing the concept of tzedakah with the first and most important point, which is that tzedakah is, the meaning of tzedakah is righteousness, tzedek, it comes from the word red, redness or justice. So it's got two meanings, a righteousness from tzedek is a righteous man. So when the person gives tzedakah, they are being righteous. And the other point is that it's justice. God gives us money and we do justice with it by giving it away. So there's, there's a few points that I want to use to bring out a few stories or anecdotes I want to use to bring out this point of the justice in charity. Not that because I gave charity, I have done such a great goodness. Yes, it's true. But really, I've actually done the justice and fulfilled the purpose of my creation. There's a, the, the one story goes back around 100 or so years, 100, and, uh, 100 plus years. In the time of the fourth Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe Maharash, um, at the time he was collecting for a particular community that um, was in dire need of help. And he happened to um, be traveling around. Um, and while he was traveling, he was also collecting. He wasn't traveling only for the sense of the reason to collect, but he also was collecting for this particular community while he was there. While he was traveling, he got a message from his family saying that his um, saying that his house had burned down and he shouldn't rush to come back because we don't have a house we to live. This was the Rebbe. So he was in Lubavitch. His, his house is in Lubavitch and he was busy traveling. So um, he stayed in the, the town that he was visiting at the moment and he stayed there for Rosh Hashanah. And when he came Rosh Hashanah, um, he dug in one particularly small shul, and it was a big town and lots of Jewish people. Um, and a lot of people never got to come to that shul. It was either too far for them to walk, or they uh, uh, they weren't members, or they never usually dug that shul. But the great Rebbe, the Rebbe Marash, everyone wanted an opportunity to see him. And being that he had stayed, he said uh, they asked if he would uh, if he would speak after Rosh Hashanah in a place in in outdoors because none of the buildings can host the whole community. And so they built a stand and, um, and uh, in the center of town outdoors, and literally the entire Jewish community came to hear this great rabbi, the fourth rabbi Rebbe, the Rebbe Marash. Now, what was interesting about this particular town is that there was a lot of wealthy people in this town. It was known to be in Russia, one of the wealthiest Russian towns at the time. And uh, when the Rebbe Marash had tried to, um, uh, to collect for this other town that was really struggling, he was unsuccessful. And he saw this as divine providence that, you know, sometimes when you go to somebody and you want to collect from them and they're not very giving, it's, uh, if you're a collector, you just give up and you say you'll go to somebody else. You don't, you don't want to waste time on somebody that's, 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 that's miserly. Uh, right? Uh, we, we all have limits in time, so do co charity collectors. So the Rebbe Marash, we thought, well, he didn't want to spend so much time in this particular community, but now by divine providence, Hashem had made him his house burn down in Lubavitch, and now he's stuck in this town. So he stands in this town on the Sunday of the day after Rosh Hashanah, and he turns to town and he says like this. He said, you understand when Hashem created people, in general, he created different categories of people. Some people are created wealthy, and some people are created poor. Now, 
the reason why Hashem does this is in order for there to be the concept of giving. Hashem could have simply made everybody wealthy. Hashem could have said everybody should have money. But if we all had money, we would all be stuck in our own cocoons and we would never give. And by not giving, we never grow. We cannot become better people if we don't give. So therefore, God created a sense of where some people are needy and some people have to give them in order to create a world of kindness. So this is what the Rebbe Marash is busy explaining in this public podium to the hundreds or thousands of people that have come to listen to him. And he says, but the problem is the poor man turns to God and says, okay, I understand that the world needs to have poor people so that you can have the concept of giving. But why do I have to be the poor person? Or why do I have to be the one running the Jewish organization to be the collector? I don't mind that you want to have, that you want to have uh, a, 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 a world of giving and taking and people having to give each other and taking care of each other, but I would rather be the giver, not the, not the receiver. So, so when the Rebbe Maharash said this particular story, um, and he, he was probably a lot more dynamic than I was, and he said this over uh, explaining different uh, Hasidic and, and different uh, Talmudic concepts, um, the people over there really opened these, uh, their hands, and uh, he, he gave them, they, 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 they made a lot. So that's the first concept that I wanted to explain, the concept of justice. The concept of justice is that God creates a world of give and take, and we are doing the, the concept of receiving is that there's Sometimes the receiver does just as much good, or we say the Talmud says even a greater good than the giver. Why? Because that when a person is able to give, it brings out a true depth and greatness and creates such peace and tranquility in the world when people give and receive and are then able to, to share that goodness. And of course, a recipient also has to have humility to accept, and it's not easy to be a recipient. Of, of money, um, and it's not easy to ask for money, at least not for most people. But that concept of giving and taking creates an environment of love and care and happiness, as opposed to an environment of communism, so to speak, where everyone just has and is given whatever they have, and you cannot have any concept of anybody giving more or less, etc. cetera. Um, and that brings out the true goodness of people. There's another story that I might get to later on about this particular topic, but I was going to go on. Does anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Okay. Sorry, Lorraine, you wanted to say something? You have to unmute. Press the microphone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now so, Medal. Yeah. Wouldn't couldn't it be that in our various numerous incarnations? Maybe we were a miserly in one of our lifetimes, and therefore in the, the subsequent one, Hashem has given us the opportunity to do what we didn't do before. By and making that, us wealthy or by making us poor? Well, if we were a chaza in our previous lifetime, he might give us an opportunity to, whether you, one has money or hasn't, give part of whatever one's got. Okay, so um, okay, there's so many stories about Sadaka and about exactly what you're saying. I, I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the, the, the general rule is we don't know about what happened in the past. We, it's not our concept, unless you're a great, great uh, tzaddik, a very holy person, you probably won't know what happens in the past, although sometimes we do have insights of stories. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the other story, actually, that I was going to say, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll say it in short. The one story is about a particular individual that he was not very wealthy, um, and uh, he, he was very generous and kind. So whatever he had, he gave of it, and he shared it with other people. Um, and he was once visited by a great tzaddik. I can't remember which tzaddik it was. And the tzaddik saw this man's generosity and he said, I want to bless you that you should have real wealth. 
And if you're so kind, then you should, God should bless you with wealth. Unfortunately, this individual, he became wealthy, but once he became wealthy, the opposite effect happened to him. He suddenly had all these fancy things which didn't want to get ruined and suddenly he became more worried. And he ended up saying, well, I'm still going to give, but he would give behind closed doors and he would send his, you know, he wouldn't let them in the house and he wouldn't be giving the coffee and tea and all the kindness that he was showing before. Um, so he would give charity and he would maybe even give more, but he wouldn't give in the same loving way. Now he was this, you know, important businessman that had to deal with important people and he didn't have time for beggars anymore. Um, and he was revisited by that holy man who told him, you know, at the, the rate you're going, I'm going to retract my blessing. I gave you the blessing to be wealthy because I saw the goodness inside of you and I knew that you can be that same person as a wealthy person. Yet you have let, let me down. And he prayed He said, said, Rebbe, Rebbe, please, I will change. I understand. I get my point. Now, there's several stories in that in that particular in, in, uh, that you can learn out. Another famous anecdote, and I can't remember where this is from. It could even be brought in the Talmud, which tells us, no, it's not the Talmud, it's somewhere else. Um, it tells a story of a man that, uh, the, the story, I, I, may, I may be ruining some of the details, but you made me just think about it because you're talking about reincarnation. Mm -hmm. The story was of an individual that had a lot of money. and. Um, he was traveling, he, he had a lot of money on him. And while he was traveling, he came to a river bank and he sat down to eat lunch. Um, and then he continued on his way. He was, a, he was, sorry, he was an extremely wealthy man and he had most of his money in a very big wallet. And then he, he sat down to eat lunch and then he left the wallet behind and continued on his way. Um, lo and behold, a, another individual came past, saw this big fat wallet of money, a huge sum of money, looked around, looked if there was no owner, saw no owner and took it. Thought it was probably forgotten by somebody. Later on, a Jew came, another, <laughs> another, another Jewish man came by, another person came by, and he, um, he lay down to rest. It was like a resting place. He lay down to rest by this, by this river. And while he's resting, suddenly the first original owner realized that he'd lost his money. So he traveled back to the river to collect his money. When he gets back there, he sees the money's gone. He sees, what does he see there? He sees a poor old man lying there on the floor, <clears throat> sleeping. He wakes up the man and says, where's my money? And the guy says, I don't know what you're talking about. I've just been sleeping here. He says, nobody else would have been here since I was lost. And he starts beating him up. Okay. So the Talmud tells us that, in, it's not the Talmud, sorry. The, the source of it says that in some type of previous uh, lifetime or something like that, the first individual owed the second individual a huge sum of money. So therefore God paid him out that they got somehow repaid later on, and that individual went on. The second, the, the, the other individual, the, the, the second Jew, had done something wrong that deserved a beating, and therefore he got beat up um, without deserving it. So sometimes the, the, the point of that story is really an incarnation related story to, telling us that sometimes certain things that happen to us in our lifetime can have can be related to different lifetimes or, or, or more than the eye sees. Um, but sometimes we say that about charity and there's numerous other stories, which I don't have time to get to all the other stories um, about charity, but in general, there's a concept of what you're saying is, is possible. However, that's not our job to, to judge. Mm. It's not our job to, 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 to know exactly what's going on with those type of things. No, it's not. But I think the way things are in the world today, nobody has really got much excess anymore because things are just so tight. But in the event that one did have a, uh, what's his name, Packer, what's Kerry yeah. Packer's son? Yeah. Of, James. James. James, yeah. yeah. So assuming one has got that kind of billions and gazillions, yeah. one person can't even spend that kind of money anyway. It's so obscene. So yeah. one would imagine, oh, well, I mean, anything more than one can spend, why not give it away? Okay, so know, let's talk, let's 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 that's a good point. Let's talk about so you know what? Let's get into 
a bit about what is the, the um, so today we so far we've discussed about the concept of giving in general as being a cost, concept of, of justice. Now, the next concept I want to discuss is from a halachic perspective, what's the obligation of charity? So I'm sure some of you are aware that according to Jewish law, there's a, there's a concept known as maser. Maser means that we're supposed to give away a one-tenth of our, of our earnings. So in temple times, we would give one-tenth one of our earnings um, would go to sometimes to the poor, sometimes to the tabernacle, sometimes to the Levite, and sometimes part of it had to be taken to be eaten in Jerusalem. So sometimes you would be uh, 20, um, uh, sorry, 20% 20 of what you were, of, of what you were earning was not being eaten or not being consumed by yourself or not for your own use. So it was sometimes somewhere between 10 and 20% would go either to the Levites, to the poor, to the Kohanim, to the temple, etc. Um, and that was known as Maiser or Truma. Um, in post-temple era, the obligation of charity is slightly different. So we're told as follows. When we look at the Torah, for example, there's there's the obligation to give one-tenth of our earnings. Now, that was in, in temple times when you had to give to particular organizations, almost like a tax, a tax to the communal affairs, to the temple, to the community leaders, to the Levites, etc. In post-temple times, we learn from somebody like Yitzchak that we're told that Yitzchak plowed his field, and he gave 10% of his earnings. And as a result of 10% that he gave, we're told that he made back, the one way of you reading it, you could read it as he made back 10 times the amount of what he sowed, and he gave away, he made 10 times, he, as a result, he got 10 times more. Or the other way of understanding it is that he made 100 times more. Um, exactly how many times more is not really so relevant um, although what is relevant is that blessing comes to any type of community. We learn out from that, and the rabbis teach us that the obligation to give of our earnings 10% remains. It's not a biblical obligation like it was in temple times, that we could not even touch that 10% beforehand. It remains a rabbinical obligation. So it's important a, to understand that it's not even, that it's not the same level of obligation. So who are we obligated to give and how are we obligated to give? The Torah tells us, the, 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 the rabbis or the Talmud tells us that we should be giving 10% of our earnings post any taxes or any other, um, other payments that we have to pay to any government or things like that. So obviously in temple times, also you had to pay taxes to the government or whenever it was. After those taxes, whatever the, the income that's left for you to take care of your family, you're supposed to give 10% of that away. Now, what happens if a person cannot give that away? If they cannot afford, what happens if they themselves are, um, are, um, are themselves receiving of charity? Do they still have to give? So you're told that, yes, everybody, even the money that receives, even the poor person that receives, or the Levite receives, has to try to find a way. If they don't have to give right now, they should keep a calculation of how much they've owed from the past and try to find a time to give later on. So I'm, I'm just talking about the law now and not about why and not about... Um, what's the meaning behind all of it? We're just talking about the cold law. What happens if a person wants to give more than 10%? So the answer to that is, the Torah tells us that aser taser, which means aser taser is generally translated as, you shall surely take a tenth. You shall surely take a tenth of your earnings. But, in, but if you look at it, the rabbi said, aser taser is really, aser means a tenth a tenth. If you take it literally, it means a tenth and a tenth, which means that we should be giving one twentieth. So from there we learn out that if a person wants to give more than a tenth, they should be giving up to a twentieth. 
So how much if somebody is wealthy or somebody is generous and not even wealthy, wants to give more than 10%, how much should they give? They should give between 10 and 20% of their income. Okay? Um, Post-tax income. Um, however, what happens if a person wants to give more than 20%? What happens if a person is James Packer level? That mm -hmm. uh, he has more than 20%. He's living off uh, millions of dollars a year and he only needs a, uh, whatever it is, a, a fraction of that for himself. Should he be giving more? Is he allowed to give more? Okay, so that's one question that we have to talk about. Um, the answer to this question is that generally we, why does the Torah limit how much you give? Why does the Torah put a limitation on how much charity you give? Seemingly the Torah should say, give at least 10%, try for 20%, because that's one fifth is actually an ideal. We've learned it out. However, you can give as much as you want. No, the Torah says that you shouldn't give more than a 20%. So the answer for that is because the Torah uh, says that a person, if a person, if some people act um, in a moment of inspiration, they might give away everything they have and be left with nothing. And that's, and if you have nothing, you have nothing to invest. You have nothing to grow your wealth. You need to have some wealth to give more. So therefore, the Torah always wants a person to keep enough for themselves to be able to continue to grow. Why does the Torah want you to continue to grow? For two reasons. Number one, so that if you have enough money to grow, to continue to invest your wealth and to grow your wealth, you can take care of yourself. And further, you can give more charity. But if you give all your charity away as soon as you turn 20 years old and every dollar you ever make, you, go, you give away, you'll never start earning more. And you know that in order to make money, you need money, right? So therefore, you have to limit how much you give in order to not to give too much. So, so that's the that's the reason for that's the reason for the limitation on giving. However, that is also there's exceptions to that rule, as you can imagine. <laughs> No, we shouldn't worry about James Parker. He, he is okay. He's okay. Well, is he giving twenty percent? So we shouldn't worry. That? Is we he giving twenty percent? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's giving twenty percent, but we don't, we're not going to worry too much about him. No, I think he's okay. I think he's okay. I, I'm sure he can give some more charity if, if he wanted to. Um, <laughs> however, um, it's interesting. The 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 Alter Rebbe. So the author of the Shulchan Aruch Harav and the founder of the Chabad movement, he wrote, he wrote something interesting, okay? And he put a massive spin on this whole concept of limitations of how much charity you give. He said, if you were to look a, deep, a, a bit deeper at the, in, into the text over there, you would see that when it says that you should only give up to 20%, he says that's talking about two things. Number one, when you need more, that that eighty percent generally for your needs, as in you need it for your bare necessities. So if you need eighty percent, you shouldn't make sure that at that point when you still you shouldn't go and delve into your pockets to give more than you can afford to give. But also, secondly, he said, if there are people that are in dire need and organizations that are in dire need. For example, either there's a family that's really poor and your family has quite a lot of money. And as a result of your family not wanting to give anyone, you might be causing terrible, or not be causing, but that family could be having major loss or health issues or poverty or possibly even die as a result of their poverty. Then there's no longer the limitation of 20%. because that was only on condition that other people weren't in dire need. But if other people are in dire need. Now, it goes on to understand that this dire need is not only physical need, but also spiritual need. Right? 
If you see, and that's why we consider Jewish organizations to be so primary. If you see a community or you see people in a community that are extremely uh, unknowledge not knowledgeable in Judaism, or they don't know anything about Jewish practice, then, then, then that particular community is considered an extreme need. And there's an extreme need to pump, to pump education and Judaism into that community. So for example, we're told that to build a shul and to build a mikvah, people should be spending as much as they can till the bare necessities of their, of their needs. Why? Because the community is not supposed to be without a shul and a mikvah. To, if you don't have teachers for the students, then you should be using more than, than your 20% because community is children. You can't have Judaism without a, a shul or without a mikvah for women to go to and without our children to have a place to learn, to learn about Judaism. So if you have those two things, it becomes an extreme need and people should spend whatever they can, even above the 20%. Obviously, with bearing in mind that they don't want to do it to the point that they're not going to be able to give ever again. Okay. Um, and then he says another thing. The altar, the 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 Shulchan Aruch says, if you had, um, if a person has done um, has done something wrong in their life, done a sin, right? Traditionally, the way we rectified sins was we bought sacrifices and we went through an atonement process. After the temple was destroyed, um, the Arizal and several uh, people instituted different fasts for each sin that we did. And sometimes it's hundreds of fasts. And, and we're told that in old days, people would actually, every time they did something, uh, a sin of the Torah, they would do like, on average, about 100 fast days for that. The Alter Rebbe says, today's day and age, we shouldn't be fasting when we do something wrong because that's not healthy. There's no point in making yourself weak physically because you've done something spiritual wrong. So what should you do is for every day that you have, um, that you have uh, or should have fasted, you should give a certain amount of money, at least the value of those days away to charity. And therefore, if, you, if you're if doing the to rectify something you've done wrong, you can give away more than your 20% because that's your obligation as your sacrifice, as your atonement for your sin. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, what shall we call it, the legal or basic approach to it. Of course, there's exceptions to all these rules. Uh, we're told that once a person passes away, people should give part of their earnings. Not at all. Um, people should people should give part of their earnings to um, to to tzedakah, even though they're going to be giving uh, up into the Torah believes in inheritance to children, um, and the the concept of your of inheritance is a Jewish concept, but it also believes in the concept of giving a legacy, and when it comes to giving a legacy, there's no limitation. So you can give as much as you want and, and you should give some of what's why because the person doesn't require that for their own living. It's only a bonus given to their children or to their family members. So they should give some, they can give more than 20% if they wanted to charity when it comes to after their passing. And that's why a lot of people are very careful to write wills uh, um, and include different chari charitable organizations in their will when they pass away, before, before they pass away. Um, okay, so that's the, the legal element of the discussion today. Before I go into the understanding element, or what should I say, the, uh, the meaning behind the charity, um, does anybody have any questions on that part that they would like to ask? No? You have to unmute yourself again. Press your microphone. There you go. Okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Um, our son in law in Yerushalayim, yes. they live in a, a small flat and there were three lovely children, and they've pretty much got nothing the way things are in Israel today. 
Yeah. Whatever he gets, he gives. I can't even. Uh, not, I can't even really tell you what he gives, but he believes that whatever he does give, he gets ten percent more than what he gives. Ten times. Ten times. Uh, ten, ten, times. ten times what he gives ten away. The more, the more, the more he gives. But he doesn't give it for that reason. He That's gives right. it because he's got such a good in the shoma. That's right. But he carries on giving. He's got nothing, but he gives. So That's there right. must be something somewhere that plays into the fact that gives him back because he is so kindly towards everybody else. So that and that's a, this is living proof. 100%. He never, yeah. 100%. So, so this is the thing, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily get this. This is a part, a part of the next part that I was going to talk to you about. Um, a lot of people think that when we give charity, we, we're giving away our money. And I already spoke to you about the justice part of it. But the truth is that we're told something interesting about charity is this. It says in the Talmud that you're not supposed to test God. Test God saying, I'll do this and you'll make that thing happen. I'll do, you know, I'll keep Shabbos and then you'll, I don't know, you'll make me win the lottery or you'll make me better or you'll make me find a wife. You're not supposed to play games or do deals with God, so to speak. You're not supposed to test God. That's the way it works. Don't, don't play a deal gaming with God. He's not a businessman. The Talmud says, except for one thing, there's one exception to that rule. And the rule is with tzedakah. You can give tzedakah with the intention that you're going to get money back. And that's okay. It's not the best way to give tzedakah. Really, you should be giving tzedakah out of the goodness of your heart. But not everyone's on that level. But just because you don't get excited about giving away your own money, like most people don't necessarily get that excited, it doesn't mean that the other person shouldn't get. And therefore, even though you don't, you're not excited to give, you should know that God promises that when you give charity, you will not lose. You will not lose out. Not only that, you will get paid back multiple times. Sometimes it says 10 times over. Sometimes it says that like, that was with Yitzchak or, or sometimes even, but sometimes it's five times over. But guaranteed, guaranteed, I could tell you, um, I've personally seen in my own life that when I give tzedakah, somehow uh, it never comes off the, the, so to speak, the calculation when of, of what I give. And even, you know, everybody has to find their way to give tzedakah. No matter what salary, if you're earning a, a, a $50 million, a $50 million salary a year, or you may a, a, getting a $50 salary a year, you could find a way to give something away. I do the 10% of that. Because when you've set it aside that it's not yours, it's not even your money to touch, you find a way to do it. You find a way to give it. Um, and yes, the Torah promises that when you give it, you're going to get paid back in, in, in numerous ways and in miraculous ways. So what I actually saw recently um, is there's actually been a scientific study come out that the most the more people give in charity, they've done studies and surveys and different people, and they found that when people started increasing their charitable giving, they started to increase the income, Jewish and non-Jewish people alike. Um, I can't, I, I was hoping before the class to, uh, to, to uh, refine it, that particular study, um, but I didn't get a chance today. Um, but anyway, you could probably Google it. And, and you'd find that there's been numerous studies that have shown that when people give charity, Jewish or non-Jewish, they get back multiple mm. times more and they never miss out. They never lose out because of it. So why is it? Why is it that charity giving becomes such an important concept? So here's the, here's the understanding behind the giving of charity. When we look at our money making, our making of money, some people, the way we look at it, the, the, Tal, the, the Talmud, when it refers to mitzvah, 
when it says the word mitzvah, how, what, what do you think of the word mitzvah when you hear the word mitzvah? You think it's one of the 613 mitzvot, right? The mitzvah, the one thing when it just says the word mitzvah in the Talmud, in the Torah, it's referring to what? The mitzvah of tzedakah. Why? Because it's considered the mitzvah. The mitzvah of all mitzvot. The mitzvah of charity. Why? Why is it the mitzvah? Because the Talmud says the mitzvah of charity is the one that encapsulates in it the entire person. Why? Because we all work to get our money, you've got to put an effort. And putting an effort could sometimes use brain power, sometimes use lack of sleep, could sometimes use hand power. All types of parts of our bodies are involved in our money making, right? So when you work to make money and then you give it away, you're not just giving away money, you're really giving yourself away. You're giving a part of your hard earned work. You're giving your whole self to it. So therefore the mitzvah of tzedakah is to give yourself away, to give parts of your own earning away. But what that does is, is it does something quite incredible, which is we look at money as something which is almost, um, what's the right term? It's almost um, a non-real existence. It's not very real. Why? I mean, what they say, money come, money go. It doesn't necessarily last. You know, money's here one day, the next day it's gone. Person could be wealthy one day, the next day it's gone. But when we give tzedakah, it changes it. Because the money that we give to tzedakah, we're told, makes all of our money into something meaningful. Not only something meaningful, but into something real. What does that mean? What it means is that normally our money is just something physical that, you, that we use to buy what we need for our life or for our luxuries if we have extra and we spend money on luxuries. So there's no major meaning to our, our money other than taking care of ourselves. But when you take your, your hard-earned money and you go and give it away to somebody else, to another Jewish cause or to another person that needs it, what you're doing with that money is you've made your money infinite because no one can ever take that away from you. No one can ever make that money can go away from you. Money given to charity is a mitzvah that lasts for all time. That help is given for all time. The benefit is going to be able to stay with you spiritually and help that person for all time. So it changes all of your income. It makes it from being something temporary and finite to something infinite and incredible. So that's the first thing. It gives realness to your money. So there's a, a famous story of um, the Rothschild family, right? The Rothschild family, they were the ones that really mm. developed the bank system, right? Um, um, what was his name? The first big Rothschild. He, was, he, was, he lived in Austria, I believe, um, in Vienna, and he became the bank or the treasurer of the king of Austria. And the king of Austria once asked him, you know, you probably wealthier than I am. You're so wealthy. I've entrusted all my money to you. You're the biggest banker in the person. He was probably the wealthiest person in the world at the time. Um, <laughs> the child. And he said, tell me, how much are you worth? And he spat up some big sum. And the king got very upset at him. He says, I know that you're worth a lot more than that. Why are you lying to me? And he said, I'm not. So he says, well, you are worth, don't you? I know that you have in, in your storage houses and whatever it is, much more money than that. He says, it's true. I do have much more money than the man that I told you. But that's not my worth. He says, my value is only the money that, 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 has, that I've actually given away. The amount of money that I told you was the amount of charity that I've got, that I've given that's why, because that's the only money that I can tell you truly mine is the money I'd given to charity. But the money that I had not yet given to charity, it could be here one day, it could go the next, I don't know. 
I'm doing whatever I can. It's in investments. It's in, in different things. And God knows in stock markets, who knows what's going to happen to it? It could be here one day. It could be invested in my house. It could be in my, in my investment properties or, or different stocks. And those could go up and down as they value. They're not necessarily mine, but the value of my charity can never change. It's always an infinite value. And that value has done what it's done in real time. So that's the, the next thing about charity is that it becomes something which has an internal value to it. Right. Sorry? Sorry. Sorry, do you have a question? No, sorry, I made a mistake. Oh, okay. Uh, now, when you're talking about charity, I was going to talk to you um, about several other things. We're told that there's many benefits to giving tzedakah. Number one, um, we're told that tzedakah, the word, um, one second. The word for giving tzedakah is, as I mentioned to you, righteousness, but also there's numerous different benefits that we can do. We're told that giving tzedakah not only brings a person back money, but also brings redemption. It says, Zion will be, uh, um, over, um, will be that Zion will be redeemed through charity. The more charity we give, it brings the redemption. It also tells us that by giving charity, we can save ourselves from death. The Talmud tells us two stories to relate the concept of the reward for charity from death. What are the two stories? The first story was the story of an individual that um, uh, that's, that stood on, I believe it was a snake or something like that. And instead of the snake killing him, he managed to kill the snake without even realizing it. And uh, one of the rabbis went up to him and said, how did you merit that you were, we, I saw an omen on you that you were supposed to die today. But yet the thing that was going to kill you, that snake, you killed it without even realizing it. And he said, what did you do specially? He says, well, I gave away my food portion today to somebody else that didn't have. So the rabbi told him, the, 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 the rabbi and thing said, that's what saved your life. When you did that act, you saved your life. He would have done. He would have done better. He would have done better if he didn't kill the nephesh, the snake. Well, he didn't kill it on purpose. He didn't kill it on purpose. He killed it by accident without even realizing it. But the snake was 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 going to be uh, his uh, his end. It was a very poisonous snake. The other story is also about a snake. Um, but this story is also some of the story about the snake story. But the story about the snake was the story of Rabbi Akiva's daughter. Rabbi Akiva famously, before his daughter got married, he got very worried because he had some type of vision as well that he was told that his daughter was not going to make it past her wedding. And there was something terrible, uh, whatever. Her, her life was not meant to be much longer than her wedding day. The next... Um, the next, uh, the, the day after the wedding, he, he rushed his daughter's house to see how she was doing. And when he came to the door, she said, Daddy, you won't believe what happened. He said, what happened? He said, last night, um, when, um, sorry, when I woke up this morning, I found that my veil, the pin of my veil, was stuck inside a snake. What had happened? She said, and that snake was a very poisonous snake. It was a poisonous, vicious snake. So he said to he said to his daughter, "What did you do special yesterday?" She said, "I saw that while everyone was dancing at my wedding, there was a poor person that came to the door, and nobody noticed them. So I gave that person my portion. I gave that person my portion, um, and I didn't think anything of it. And I went home." I went home from my own wedding hungry. 
So Rabbi Akiva said that by you giving away, giving that tzedakah to that other person, you actually had saved your life. I know that we don't like killing animals or anything like that. Um, but, but the point is that the Talmud was trying to bring out this thing that we have many stories of when sometimes doing the concept of going beyond our own ability, stretching beyond our own means, when we do something, it, spread, it stretches ourselves. When we stretch ourselves more than we can think we could handle, we give a little bit more than we think we're able to, says uh, the Talmud, teaches us from there, it makes God to stretches things for us, both financially, materialistically, emotionally, and health-wise. That when we stretch ourselves, God, so to speak, stretches himself for us. Okay? So those are the two stories that the Talmud relates about the concept of how charity saves lives. Uh, of course, there's been many stories later on, famously the Rebbe. Um, whenever he, um, he's, uh, first of all, in the last year, in the last, in the later years of his life, he never, there were so many people that wanted to see him. He had, he, he, had, he had lists of thousands of people that wanted to see the Rebbe. So you can imagine it simply became impossible. One person cannot spend, there's not enough time in the day for one man to meet with so many people. So what he did is he changed it. They stopped uh, doing private meetings with people known as Yechidiot. He started doing Sunday dollars. And what was that? Mm -hmm. Everybody that wanted to meet up with him would come, would, would stand from, from 11 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the morning outside his office, and people would come and he would give them a dollar. Now, you can look on YouTube if I have time later on, I can show you. Literally every single Sunday, sometimes tens of thousands of people would come past, but at least thousands of people, and the Rebbe would give every single one of those people. But he wouldn't talk to them for long. He would give them, and usually it was, a 10 second meeting where the Rebbe would give the person a blessing and sometimes the person would say a quick request for something or a blessing for something and sometimes the person would be a bit longer if they had something really pressing or the person was uh, you know a big uh, politician they would try to get in a few more words of the Rebbe's time but that's the way they did it and sometimes people wondered why is the Rebbe giving out a dollar like you're meeting people why are you giving out a dollar so the Rebbe said because whenever I see people, I want it to be a positive action. So I give this them the dollar, and I hope that with that, they'll go and put it into charity. Most people didn't put the actual dollar that they received from the Rebbe into charity. They would keep that dollar, and I told this day, have those dollars that I've received. But you take that same value and you give it to charity, but you keep the actual dollar um, that 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 you receive from and today's day and age, until this day there are tens or hundreds of thousands of me of dollars that people have received mm -hmm. from the Rebbe um, on Sundays. But the point was that when two Jews meet, they have an opportunity to do a mitzvah. What better mitzvah than the easy mitzvah of charity? As a matter of fact, it's the Rebbe started campaigns, mitzvah campaigns. And one of the campaigns was that the woman should light candles every Friday. So Chabad started publicizing everyone, candle lighting is and going down and uh, giving out candles. Uh, other things were like uh, putting on twill in. So we started helping people put on twill. One of the campaigns actually is not necessarily known as much is charity, the mitzvah of tzedakah. Send out charity boxes, help people give, give charity. Because by doing that, we're giving them such a great opportunity by helping other people give tzedakah. Okay, there's, um, there's, there's so much more that we can say about charity. Uh, but, but I'll, I'll just, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, 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 I'll leave it up with this. Um, when people give tzedakah, we, we try to give whatever people need. But generally, or very often, people give charity in, 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 in multiples of 18. Why in multiple of 18s? Because 18 is chai. And we want to give a person because we're showing that with charity, we're giving chai, we're giving a life. And when we, when we do that, we're showing that our lives, as much as we work hard to have good lives and to have what we need for our lives, 
as much as our lives are there for ourselves, they're also there. Our life of meaning is only truly a life that is shared with others, that the goodness of our life we can share with others. And that is done primarily through um, sharing of ourselves. And there's numerous ways of how we do it. The most fundamental way of how we do it is by giving to doctor. But we can give of our lives not just by giving financial charity. We give it also by giving of our time, of our advice, of our love and care to people at need. So yes, the financial obligation may be 10%, but whenever we have an opportunity to help another person, to call somebody to, to, to volunteer for an organization or to whatever it is, that's also the category of Tadakiam. And by doing that, what we're ultimately doing is just like when we give char charity, we elevate all of our income. All of our income now becomes like the blessings of Hashem. It becomes uplifted, when we give part of our time and all of our actions become charitable actions, give, become Hashem's actions. And that's why that concept of giving of ourselves is the ultimate cause of the redemption. Why Mashiach will come? Because Mashiach is the time when people no longer are selfish or self-centered, but they're a time when people are interested in giving of themselves to others. Okay, so with that in mind, we conclude tonight with, uh, I know that some people told me that they're going to watch on Facebook, but um, for those that did join us in person, thank you so much. If anybody wants to ask anything or add anything, please feel free. But um, I hope you have learned something about the concept of charity. We didn't have time to get into all the texts, but you have a, a somewhat of an understanding of why in Yiddishkeit, why in Judaism, charity is one of the foremost pillars of our uh, of, of our continuity in our practice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody want to add anything? Ask anything? Shkoyach. Shkoyach to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate your words of wisdom. Thank you. I wanted to end off with one thing. I actually, I, I sent this video once to somebody over here. Um, and I was trying to find the video, but I didn't have time to show it. But the video was of a businessman that had once um, uh, come to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe had told him that he, uh, sorry, he came to the Rebbe and said to the Rebbe, I need advice because I, I'm a very successful businessman, he says. I sold my business, I made a lot of money off it, and now I've got an opportunity to buy the business back. But I don't need the money, I've got plenty of money, what should I do? So the Rebbe told him two things, which is fascinating. Number one, he said, a person isn't obligated to use all their talents for as long as possible. So if you're a talented businessman, you should continue using that talent. If you, for some reason, sold the business and you no longer enjoy that business, you should continue using your talent in that area, if it's in business, if it's in something else, but it doesn't have to be back the same business. So yes, if you want and you still enjoy that business, go back to that business, but should you be continuing to work and where you're talented and making money? Certainly. And then the Rebbe also told him that particularly, you should never think it's not possible, he says, for a Jewish person to say, I've had, I have enough. <laughs> because I have enough means I have enough for myself. But you could be James Packer and still not have enough, right? Because there's always more that you can give. So, so you may have enough for yourself, but does everybody else have enough? No. So then you have an obligation to use your talents to make more money so that you can give more away. So yes, you may have enough for yourself. You may want to just sit down now and relax and study Torah all day or, or sip and drink tequila on the beach. Yes, but your, your life, you have a special talent and your talent is not drinking tequila on the beach. Your life is, your, your talent is maybe making money and helping communities and helping Jewish ch children with, with uh, learn about Torah and connecting to Judaism or helping poor people uh, have food to eat, whatever it is. That's where you get your talent. So tzedakah, also is that ability to find our true calling in life 
and use it to the best of our ability, especially when it comes to uh, our, our main career goals or whatever it is, and taking that in the career to use it for something positive and also the benefits, the money that comes to use it for something beneficial. Thank you. Okay. Taking something along with that made me think of something, not exactly, but the concept that we know about the world's population growing and the concept of sustainability and enough food to feed the growing population of the whole world. And I'm just wondering how that would fit in. Just in okay, sense. so it's interesting. It's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting question. But I'll say this about that question. Two things. First of all, it's a question about it's a question about you know having children and how Judaism pushes us to 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 have children. Mm. But um, it's also about giving and 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 uh, taking care of others. Uh, and when we take care of others, we'll have enough for whatever we need. Mm. But when people think, you know, they people first started talking about overpopulation in the late, well, it really became serious back in the late 1800s. The scientists of the time, and I can't remember their names, but they famously started writing articles based on mathematics that if the populations, the, the population started to grow really, uh, really quickly at that point, the late 1800s, it started to really grow. You'll see that over the last century, the world has gone about 20 times in population. Um, and he said that with the, there was, they're all saying that with the population growth, it's going to be impossible, unsustainable. Um, yet what you see is that the more people we have, the more food there's been in abundance. Actually, the, the abundance of food and materialism has grown with the population. And then some people want to say, yes, but we're starting to run out of those resources and there's environmental problems. And the answer to that is, the answer to that is the worst thing that we could do is to stop having children because then you'll have a lot of old people that have no one to support them. Mm -hmm. That's number one from a scientific perspective. Uh, that's the biggest problem that, that Western mm -hmm. countries are suffering from currently. But more than that, on a basic uh, level, um, the more people you have, the more ingenuity you have in order to find the sources of food and the more ingenuity to find more food and to build in sustainable ways of making food, the more food you'll have. And for that, you also need good people and you need more of them. So I actually believe that the, the, the population growth is a sign of Mashiach because when Hashem creates the world, the first commandment he gives to Adam is be, be, be fruitful and multiply or to fill the earth. And only in the last century have we started to fill the earth. Have we been truly fruitful and multiplied? Because in the last century, the world population has gone from about 700 million, sorry, to about seven to eight billion. So mm. in the last century, we've really truly grown. Mm. And I think that that's a sign. It's my own personal thing. I don't know if there's any truth to it, but it's actually a sign of Moshiach. We're starting to fulfill the prophecy that the God create the world with to fill up the land with people. So I think it's a good thing. Interesting thoughts. Good. Okay. Lala Tov, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you for joining. Have a wonderful night. Thank hour. you so much. And you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Rabbi. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.